Our topic for today is types, composition, and properties of soil. And this is part A because in this topic we'll be focusing on just the types and the composition of soil. Now, it interests you to know that soil covers the surface of the earth and it's the medium for plant growth. So without soil, plants will not grow. Now, plants are anchored in the soil by their roots and these roots are spread in all directions. These plants do draw their water and most of their nutrients from the soil. So the soil is the source of food for plants, animals, and man. So in this lesson, we will be discussing again the types, the properties, and composition of soil. But our focus will be on the types of soil and the composition of soil. And by the end of the lesson, you should be able to identify the types of soil and also discuss the chemical and biological composition of soil. So now let's take a look at the types of soil. There are three main types of soil, which include the sandy soil, the clay soil, and the loamy soil. So let's start with the sandy soil. Now what is the sandy soil? A soil is said to be sandy if the proportion of sand particles in a sample of the soil is very high. So if you take a sample of soil and you check that the proportion of sand in that sample is high, that soil will be called a sandy soil. So the particles of sand are mainly quartz. Now let's take a look at the properties of sandy soil. The first we have is that sandy soil is coarse green. That means it's rough and gritty. Another property of sandy soil is that it has large pore spaces, which are some tiny holes that are found in the soil. So sandy soil usually has large pore spaces, not tiny pore spaces, but large pore spaces. Sandy soils are also well aerated because of those large pore spaces that they possess. Air can easily pass through, and not only air, those spaces can also accommodate water. So they have, that means water can easily pass through, that's what I mean. So because of the large pore spaces and because they are well aerated, water can easily pass through. So they usually are called, they usually have low water holding capacity. That means the ability to retain water is low because of the large pore spaces that the sandy soils do have. Now percolation in sandy soil is high, but capillarity is low. Now what is percolation? That's the downward movement of water through the soil. Now because sandy soils have a large pore spaces, they cannot retain water. You know, we said in one of the, character, the properties, I said low water holding capacity. So with that, that means their percolation will be high because they cannot retain water. Water easily goes down. And I can also say another point, they said, but capillarity is low. Capillarity is the ability of water to rise straight medium. So because of the large pore spaces, water easily goes down through the sandy soil and cannot easily rise up. So percolation is downward movement while capillarity is the upward movement. So sandy soils have a high rate of percolation, that's downward movement, while low rate of capillarity, that means upward movement, is low. Another property of sandy soil is that sandy soil supports leaching. Now, what is leaching? That leaching has to do with the washing away of plant nutrients below the roots of plants. That's beyond the reach of the roots of plants. And this can lead to poor um, fertility of the soil. So you can see that sandy soils are usually low in plant nutrients because of leaching. We also have a property of sandy soil which states that it is not sticky when wet and so it cannot form a cast or ribbon. Now when sandy soil, you apply some water to sandy soil, it's, it's not sticky. So you cannot mold sandy soil into a cast. We also have another property which states that it heats up easily during the day and cools, during, cools down quickly during the night. Sandy soil does not support water logging. Because of the high rate of um, percolation and the low rate of capillarity, 
you can find that you can see that sandy soil will not be able to retain water and so it will not support water logging. Sandy soil is also low in plant nutrients. Remember I also said that because it encourages leaching which leads to the washing down of nutrients beyond the reach of the roots of plants. Hence nutrients are not available, plant nutrients are not available richly in sandy soil. So this will also affect crop cultivation. Now another property of sandy soil has to do with the color. Sandy soils are usually brown or whitish in color but the, from the picture there you can see that the color there is brown. Now let's take a look at how we can improve sandy soil. Remember I said because of the leaching which takes place in sandy soil where nutrients are lost or washed down beyond the reach of the roots of plants, we have to see a way of how to improve our sandy soil so that we can, as a farmer, you can make good use of it. The first method has to do with planting of cover crops. These cover crops are usually leguminous crops that have a spreading ability and this can help. Such cover crops also help to improve the fertility of um, sandy soils by binding the soil particles together. Mulching is also part of it, a way of improving our sandy soils. This has to do with just putting you could, um, a, a material, it could be polythene sheet, it could be grass, on the surface of the soil. This helps to reduce evaporation of water, moisture from the soil, and when such plant materials also decay, they can add humus to the soil. So that means, that's a means by which we can improve our sandy soil. You can also improve sandy soil by simply applying compost manure or farmyard manure, manure gotten from the wastes of our animals. You can apply it to the sandy soil or compost where you, the plant materials are decomposed. That's it, it evolves a process and after such decomposition you can apply it to sandy soil. This will help to improve our sandy soil. You can also improve sandy soil by avoiding bush burning because when you burn bush, you're also killing some of the microorganisms, some soil borne organisms in the soil which have a role to play in helping the fertility of the soil. So when you burn bush, you're killing such organisms. So we have to avoid bush burning in order to improve our sandy soil. Let's take a look at another type of soil which is called the clay soil. Now what is a clay soil? A soil is said to be clayey if the proportion of clay in such a sample of the soil is high. So we'll look at the properties of clay soil. We have the first which states that clay particles are fine, powdery and smooth when dry. So if you get a sample of a clay soil and you feel it, you'll find out that the particles are fine, they are powdery and they are smooth when dry. Now the particles of clay soil are also sticky when wet. So when you apply some water to a clay soil and fill it with your hands, you'll find out that it's sticky. That's another property of clay soil. So because of that sticky nature, you can mold it into shapes. I can see in the picture, and uh, clay soil is being molded. You can mold it into shapes. We have another property of clay soil which states that it is poorly aerated with high water holding capacity. Now, because of the tiny pore spaces in clay soil as against the large pore spaces in sandy soil, which prevents sandy soil from retaining water, clay soil has tiny pore spaces within it and this helps it to retain water. That's why it's poorly aerated and has a high water holding capacity. That means the ability for it to retain water is high. Okay, now particles are tightly bound together. Because of the tiny pore spaces, the particles of clay are usually bound tightly together. Percolation is low, but capillarity is high in clay soils. I said percolation has to do with the downward movement of water. So you can see that in clay soil, because of the tiny pore spaces, water doesn't go down easily. So percolation is low. While capillarity is high, that's the ability for water to rise up within a soil sample. Now, because of the tiniest pore spaces, this encourages water to rise up 
in clay soil. So it's, clay soil usually has a high capillarity. The next property of clay soil we have is that it does not support leaching. Because of the tiny pore spaces which prevents water from easily draining through clay soil, and as water is drained through clay soil easily, nutrients are also lost through that process. But um, clay soil doesn't encourage leaching because of the tiny pore spaces. So it retains water, and as it retains such water, nutrients, plant nutrients are also retained. Now it is hard when dry and sticky when wet. When clay soil is dry, it's hard, and when it's wet, it's sticky. It can easily be easily form a ribbon or cast when molded because of the tiny pore spaces and the sticky nature or its ability to retain water clay soil can be molded into a ribbon or cast the picture tells us you can see from the picture molding that's taking place and it also supports water logging and erosion clay soil supports water logging because of the tiny pore spaces and its ability to retain water that's high level rate of capillarity and low rate of percolation. A lot of water is retained in clay soil and this will lead to water logging and erosion. Now taking a look at the color of clay soil, you can see that clay soil could be gray, could be yellow or red in color. The next type of soil we'll look at is called the loamy soil. I believe many of us are familiar with this term loamy soil. Now what is a loamy soil? A loamy soil is a mixture of sand and clay particles with high proportion of organic matter. Now, what are organic matter? Organic matter has to do with dead, decaying, or decaying plant and animal remains. So when there's a mixture of sand, clay, and organic matter, the soil that is formed is called a loamy soil. And the loamy soil is more fertile than either the clay or sandy so let's take a look at the properties of loamy soil loamy soil is moist is loose and it also has moderate sized pore spaces as against the sandy soil that has large pore spaces and the clay soil that has tiny pore spaces for the loamy soil it has moderate sized pore spaces it is non-powdery and non-sticky as against the clay soil that is powdery and sticky. So the loamy soil is non-powdery and non-sticky in texture. Now it can easily be worked on or cultivated. For the clay soil, you cannot easily work on it because of the sticky nature. So farm implements can get um, stuck with a lot of mud on it. But for the Loamy soil, you can easily work on it and you can easily cultivate the loamy soil. The loamy soil also contains lots of organic matter, which is humus, which has to do with the dead, decayed plant and animal remains. Remember we said it's a soil that contains a portion of clay, sand and organic matter. The loamy soil is well aerated and it can hold water. That means aeration has to do with the not erosion, aeration has to do with the movement of air within a medium. So loamy soil is well aerated and it can also hold water, but it does not support erosion and water logging. It also contains a lot of plant nutrients. Why? Because of the presence of organic matter, which has to do with the decomposed plants and animal remains. And it is the best soil for agriculture. Taking a look at the color of loamy soil, because of the presence of the humus or organic matter in it, it's usually dark brown or black in color. Now let's look at the chemical and biological composition of soil. So we're done with the types of soils and we looked at their properties. So now we're going to look at the chemical and biological composition of soil. Now soil is made up of five components. Let's take a look at the components. We have first the soil minerals, which are also called inorganic matter or mineral matter. We have organic matter as another component. We also have soil water. So water is present in soil, is a component of soil. We also have soil air. There's also air present in soil. 
And finally, we also have soil organisms, which are also called the living organisms. When you dig into the soil, you find that there are living organisms like termites, earthworms. These are examples of some organisms that can be found in soil. So soil is made up of five components. Now, we also need to take note that this organic matter has to do with the feces or the decomposing plants and animals remains, which I've stated earlier. So let's look at the minerals or inorganic matter, organic matter, water and air. These three components or the four components, mineral or inorganic matter, organic matter, water and air are collectively referred to as the physical components of the soil. So in soil, those five components can be divided into two. We have the physical components and we have the biological components. The physical component has to do with the minerals or inorganic matter, the organic matter, water and air, while the biological components have to do with the living organisms found in the soil. So we're going to take each of those components one after the other and let's get to understand better what they are or what they refer to. They are referred to. So starting with soil minerals or inorganic constituents or inorganic matter. This has to do with um, fragments of rocks of various kinds, sizes and shapes. Remember that rocks are formed, soil is formed from rocks. So this and rocks are made up of minerals. So these soil minerals we have has to do with the rock fragments, which could be which are usually of various kinds, sizes and shapes. And they usually form the bulk of soil, which is about 45%. So from that pie chart you can see it forms about 45% of the total volume of soil. And as I said earlier, it has to do with rock fragments and it consists of gravel, stones, sand, seals, and clay. Still on soil minerals, the percentage of mineral component of the soil will help the farmer or the agriculturist to know what type of soil is present. It could be a clay soil, loamy soil, or a sandy soil. Now, if it's up to 70%, that soil is referred to as a sandy soil. Now, mineral matter is a source of essential nutrients that plants usually use to grow and develop. Let's take a look at the importance of mineral matter on agriculture or the effects of mineral matter on agriculture. The first point we have there is that it forms the solid part of the soil, meaning that it provides, is the means by which plants get their support. So it's also the main source of plant nutrients, whether macronutrients or micronutrients, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium. These are plant nutrients, so mineral matter is the main source of these plant nutrients. It's also the home for soil living organisms. So that's where you can find soil living organisms. It holds water and air for both plants and animal activities, so which are very important for the survival of our plants and animals. So the mineral matter holds water and air for both plants and animal activities. And it also helps to moderate the effect of soil temperature. That's how hot or cold the um, soil is. So the mineral matter helps to moderate the effects of temperature of our soil. And it can also affect soil porosity. Porosity has to do with the pore spaces. That's some holes, tiny holes that are found in soil. So mineral matter affects soil porosity. The next component of soil we'll look at is organic matter. Now, what are or what is organic matter? This represents the remains of the decomposition of plants and animals at various stages, and it occupies just 5% of the total volume of soil. So take a look at our pie chart there, showing the various components or percentages of these compos various components of soil. You can see that organic matter is 5% only. Now, when deposited on soil, they decay to form a dark color on the uppermost part of the soil, and this is usually called organic matter or humus. So when they undergo decay, organic matter, they are called organic matter 
or humans. Now, still on organic matter, they said when it has to do with um, knowing the primary source of organic matter, plants are the primary source of organic matter, while animals are the secondary source of organic matter. Let's also look at the difference between organic matter and humans. There's a difference. Now, organic matter is usually based on the texture. Organic matter is usually rough or fibrous, while humus is usually smooth and dark in color. Now, we'll be looking at the importance and effects of organic matter on agriculture. Organic matter is a very rich in plant nutrients, which are needed by plants for their growth and development. It's also a habitat of some soil microorganisms. And organic matter helps to prevent leaching, which has to do with the washing down of plant nutrients beyond the reach of the roots of plants. So when organic matter is present in adequate amounts, it can help to prevent leaching. It also helps to prevent erosion and also helps to prevent evaporation of water from the soil. It also allows for good drainage. That means encouraging good drainage and holds water in the soil. So you can see that um, organic matter helps to improve the structure of the soil. So helping it to have good drainage and also helping it to hold water. It also helps to improve the structure of the soil, as I said earlier, by binding the particles of these coarse textured soils together. And an example of a coarse textured soil is sandy soil, which I talked about earlier on. So when you add organic matter, it helps to improve the coarse texture of our sandy soils by binding the particles together. Organic matter also helps to increase the water holding capacity of our soil. So especially for sandy soil that has a low water holding capacity, and if you want to improve it, you add organic matter. So it helps to increase the water holding capacity of the soil. It also helps to moderate soil temperature, which is needed for good development and growth of the roots of our plants. So that if the temperature is too hot, you know, it's the, when you apply organic matter, it can help to moderate it. It also has a buffering effect that moderates pH values. So it helps to balance the effects of the acidity and alkalinity level of our soil. It also helps to improve the soil's cation exchange capacity. What is cation exchange capacity? It has to do with the um, negative charges that are found in the soil which absorb plant um, nutrients cations. So organic matter helps to improve the cation exchange capacity of our cells. It also helps to improve soil aeration. That's a movement of air within the soil. So when you apply organic matter, if aeration, soil aeration is improved. And it's also responsible for the loose, friable condition of our soil. The next composition of soil we'll look at is what we call soil organisms, which are also referred to as living organisms. This has to do with the plants and animals that live in the soil. And here we have what is called microflora, which has to do with the bacteria, the algae, the fungi, actinomycetes. We also have the microfauna, and an example of microfauna is the nematodes. And we also have the mesofauna, which has to do with earthworms, rats, plants, and snails. So when you hear flora, we're talking about plant-based organisms. Then when you have fauna, we're talking about animal-based organisms. Let's look at the importance or the effects of living organisms on agriculture. These living organisms, which has to do with the plants and animals, they help to improve the soil structure and granulation. They also help to improve the aeration of our soil. For example, as plants are growing on such soil, they could, or living organisms are burrowing into such soil, because remember, living organisms also live in soil, they create holes. And these holes or pathways encourage air to circulate within the soil. They also help to decompose organic materials and plant residue in the soil to form humus. They also help, as living organisms, 
present in the soil help to improve soil water percolation or drainage, which has to do with the downward movement of water in the soil because of their burrowing activities within the soil, creating holes. These holes help to improve water percolation. Then also help to they also help to improve the colloidal properties of soil. That's the mixing properties of our soil. Now let's look at some of the bacteria too that help in fixing nutrients into the soil because that's another importance of um, living organisms in agriculture. Bacteria, which some bacteria are present in the soil and they have a role to play by helping to fix nutrients into the soil. And examples of such bacteria we have is the Rhizobium leguminosarum, which lives in the root nodules of leguminous plants. And what do they do? As I said, they convert atmospheric nitrogen into nitrogen that is used by the plants. So these bacteria are usually found in the root nodules. Those are some swellings found in the root of leguminous plants. And examples of leguminous plants like the cowpea, the groundnut, soya bean. We also have another type of bacteria called Azotobacter and Clostridium. These live freely in the soil, not in the root nodules of leguminous plants, but they live freely in the soil. And they also carry out the same purpose. They help to fix atmospheric nitrogen into the soil, which will be used by the plants. Still on the importance or effects of living organisms on agriculture, they say some of these organisms produce acidic materials, and these acidic materials help to break down rocks, which leads to formation of soil. Now, some of them also enhance the cation exchange capacity of the soil, which I told you cation exchange capacity has to do with the negative charges found in the soil, which absorb plant nutrients. So it helps to, some of these um, living organisms help to enhance the cation exchange capacity of the soil. Now their brain activities also leave holes within the soil which encourages root penetration. They also help to increase the minerals or nutrient status of our soil because some of these living organisms when they die and decompose, they also release nutrients into the soil. They also help to stabilize the soil pH, which has to do with the degree level of acidity or alkalinity in our soil. And how do they achieve this? By increasing the soil organic matter and buffering effects. That's buffering has to do with the way of stabilizing, that's creating a balance between the alkalinity and acidity of our soils. We have another composition of soil which has to do with soil air. Now, this refers to the gases that are present in the soil pores found within the soil particles. Remember, pores has to do with the holes that are found within the soil. So gases are also present within the pore spaces that are found in our soil. Now, this soil air varies depending on the amount of soil water and the size of the pore spaces. So if there's a lot of water, if it's a waterlogged soil, that means it will have little air within it. And if the pore spaces are tiny, it will, it will also have little air or gases moving within it. And the types of soil, whether it's a sandy soil or a clay soil, from our properties discussed about sandy and clay soil, you understand that the sandy soil will have large pore spaces, so it should have more air as compared to the clay soil that has tiny pore spaces so the clay soil will have less air within it and also the amount of living organisms in the soil will also determine the way the amount of air that is found in the soil now the percentage of air within the soil is just 25 percent just as water too was 25 percent but we have not discussed water yet but still on air is about 25 percent now i've talked and explained earlier on, on aeration so what is aeration is the ability of air to circulate freely in the soil. So it's important for us to also understand that terminology. Okay, so the soil air is about 25% of the total volume of the soil. And we have a terminology called aeration, which has to do with the ability of air to circulate freely in the soil. So it's important that we understand the terminology aeration. Let's take a look at the importance and effects of soil air on agriculture. 
Now, soil, air, especially oxygen, is necessary for the growth and development of our plants. It also promotes easy germination of seeds. So with the presence of oxygen, seeds can easily germinate. We also know that there are organisms that are found in the soil based on the components of soil. We know that soil, we have living organisms that are found in soil. These organisms do require oxygen for respiration. And as they respire, they also produce or release carbon dioxide. And this carbon dioxide in the soil, when it combines with water, can cause acidity that can lead to the weathering of rocks. Now, some plant disease organisms, for example, Fusarium, can cause a disease called damping off. And this disease is usually favored by poor aeration. So when there's poor aeration, this disease organism can easily thrive easily and cause a disease called damping off disease. Now, some reactions in the soil, particularly carbon and nitrogen cycle, also need air or oxygen for such reactions to take place. Let's look at another component of soil, which has to do with soil water. So water is also a component of soil, and this refers to the water that is found in the soil, which could either be from the rain or from by irrigation. Now, it occupies about 25% of the total volume of the soil. And this water is usually found in the pore spaces. Remember, those are tiny holes that are found within the soil. So it could be occupied by air, it could also be occupied by water. So water is also found in the pore spaces. Now, when this water is too much within the pore spaces, such water will be termed a waterlogged water habitat. So it can lead to water logging when the water is too much. Let's take a look at some types of soil water. We have about four types of soil water. We have the hygroscopic water, the capillary water. We have the gravitational water as well. And we also have the field capacity water. So we'll start with the hygroscopic water and let's get to understand what the hygroscopic water is. So this is a type of water that is present in air dry soils. So when you see a soil, there's a soil sample that is dry, it may look as if there's no water present, but there's still some level of water present in an air dry soil. And at that stage, the water cannot be easily removed by evaporation. So such water is usually held tightly within the soil particles. And the suction pressure that holds that water within the soil particles is about 31 bars. So such type of water, which is the hygroscopic water, is not, is not available to the plants because it's usually held tightly within the, so um, the soil particles at a suction pressure of greater than 31 bars. Let's also take a look at um, the capillary water. Now, this is a type of water which rises above the water table in the soil. Now, there's a, a water table just has to do with the level of moisture content within the soil that's below the soil, but still within the soil, that um, such capillary water usually rises above that water table in the soil and is found in the capillary pores of the soil. Usually it's available to the plants and the plants can take up this water at a suction pressure of 0 0.1 to 31 bars. We also have the gravitational water and the field capacity water, but taking a look at the gravitational water, this water has to do with water that is excess in the soil which can drain from the soil under the influence of gravity. And this type of water occurs immediately after rainfall or irrigation. So immediately after rainfall or irrigation, the type of water that is, you see there is called gravitational water. And such water is not available to the plants because it can drain off easily under the influence of gravity. And as it drains off easily, it encourages leaching, which has to do with the loss of nutrients through the soil from the soil. Then we have field capacity. This has to do with the type of water that is left in the soil after this excess water has been drained off following heavy rainfall. 
So after the gravitational water has been drained off, what we have is the field capacity water and is available to the plants. Let's look at the importance of soil water on agriculture. Now, it's an agent of weathering of rocks. So water is needed in the breaking down of rocks. It also helps to dissolve plant nutrients into solutions, which is a form by which the plants will now absorb the nutrients from the, through the roots of the plants from the soil. Now, it's also an essential material for photosynthesis. That has to do with the process by which plants manufacture their food in the presence of sunlight. Water is also a raw material that is needed for photosynthesis. Hydrolysis of many food enzyme nutrients and enzymatic activities are also promoted by the presence of water. Now, there's also loss of water from plants through a process called transpiration helps to cool our plants. So when plants lose water through the leaves, that's called the process is called transpiration. This helps to cool the plants. Now, water also aids tillage of our soil, which has to do with um, some agricultural activities on the soil to encourage the rooting or growing of our plants. So without water, the soil pan becomes too hard and tillage cannot take place. So with water, it makes tillage easy and this can help to improve the soil structure. Still on the importance of soil water, it helps to promote the activities of soil organisms because we know living organisms are present in the soil and they are living, so they need to survive. They also need water for their survival. So it promotes the activities. It's also needed for germination of seeds, just as oxygen is needed for germination of seeds. Water is also needed for the germination of seeds and it also provides a medium for soil reactions that take there are certain reactions that take place in the soil water enhances such reactions and then it also aids the turgidity of cells now without turgidity the plants will not be able to stand firm and water is needed to enhance the turgidity that has to do with the firmness of cells Water also protects plants from the injurious effects of high temperature. So when the temperature of the temperature is too high and water is applied or given to the plants, you can see it can help to cushion the effects of such high temperature. Okay, so far we've discussed about the types and the composition of our soil. Now we're just going to have a look or a rundown of what we discussed. I stated earlier on that there are three main types of soil. We have the sandy soil, the clay soil, and the loamy soil. We also looked at the properties of each of these soil types. For example, the sandy soil, we said it's coarse grained. It has large pore spaces. It's well aerated. It also has a low water holding capacity. We also looked at the clay soil, which has to do with particles that are fine, powdery, and smooth when dry. They are sticky when wet and they can also be molded into shapes. They are also poorly aerated. That means they do not encourage the free flow of air or oxygen within the pores. They also have a high water holding capacity, just to mention a few. We also looked at the loamy soil and we looked at the properties, which include it being moist, loose, with moderate sized pore spaces. Is also non powdery and non sticky in texture and can easily be worked on or cultivated, and it also contains a lot of organic matter or humus, just to mention a few. Thank you for listening. So, we'll now take a look at some questions based on what I've explained to you so far. This question says Which of the following soil water is tightly held to the surface of the soil particles? We talked about different types of water. We talked about the hygroscopic water, the gravitational water, the capillary water, and the field capacity water. Now, the answer here is hygroscopic water. It's at this level that the, it's found in air dry soils where the water is held tightly within the pore spaces and such water is not available to the plant. It has a suction um, pressure of over 31 bars. So the answer is hygroscopic water. So this question states that the chemical composition of soil is mostly influenced by 
we have climate, we have time, we have topography, and we have parent material. Now, from our soil profile, we know that we have the A horizon, the B horizon, the C horizon, and the D horizon. The A horizon has to do with the top soil, the B horizon has to do with the subsoil, the C horizon has to do with the parent material, and the D horizon has to do with the bedrock. Now, when I talked about the chemical composition, um, mineral matter, which is the inorganic mineral matter, which is part of the components of soil, we said they are got it from rock fragments. And we know that this rock fragment lead to soil. These rock fragments are also got it from the bedrock. So from the bedrock, we have the parent material. So the answer here is parent material, because from the parent material, we also now have the top subsoil and the subsoil. So the answer here is parent material.